So this is the uh, final in conservation with of the season. Um, we're two seasons old. My guest is as great as the first guest and all the other guests in between. Joe Shoot, a man that uh, I've known for a few years and we'll actually get onto that shortly. But um, finally, I must say, or before actually chatting, I must say that um, today is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. And uh, thank you very much for that. And of course, I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. So I've kind of done it back to front today, but who cares? You know, that's how, it, how things are sometimes. So Joe, um, before we find out who you are, let's find out how are you and where you are. Uh, I'm very well indeed, uh, thank you. And uh, I am in uh, Sheffield in uh, South Yorkshire, uh, where the rain is pelting down outside uh, and I can still hear the sparrows going from my study window. That's very nice. I've got sparrows going here as well, actually, they may be hearing your ones. Um, I thought I'd have a, a background in your honour, considering we're speaking about the weather and also chatting about your book, which we'll talk about shortly, which is forecast a diary, a diary, diary, a diary of the lost seasons. Um, firstly, Joe, a question that I always ask everyone: um, where, where did you? I know you're interested in nature because I know we've met, we've obviously met a few years ago. But where, where did your interest come from? Interest in nature. Hmm. For me, it was something that happened sort of reasonably late in my life, I, I would say. I, I grew up in central London, as um, viewers and listeners might hear, despite being in Sheffield, my Yorkshire accent isn't up to much. And uh, I kind of didn't have, as a kid, that much exposure to the sort of countryside on a sort of day-to-day basis but what I did have were grandparents who lived in North Yorkshire and uh, every summer we'd go and stay for them for a couple of weeks and uh, they live up in a place uh, called the North York Moors which is a, a beautiful national park up there and I remember so well those summer days sort of roaming over the heather moorland and uh, getting into sort of hearing I had no idea what they were but you know hearing things like curlew and lapwing and kind of being amazed at these, especially when you compare it to the sort of birds that you'd see around central London at the time, you know, these kind of otherworldly species. So I always sort of love being outdoors and outside. And then uh, I, I went to Leeds University, um, history there. Uh, and it was really while I was at Leeds that um, I, I kind of probably got into nature, as, as, as people say. Uh, Leeds as a city is very close to the Yorkshire Dales, another national park up there. And I'd regularly go out with friends walking uh, on the hills and, and, and seeing, you know, things like um, grey wagtail, for example, sort of hopping along moorland streams, um, uh, curlew again. They had beautiful red kites on the outskirts of Leeds that we'd always drive past in a stately home called Harewood House. And uh, I had one of these real student cars, a tiny Nissan Micra that we'd all sort of pile into when we were driving out there. And uh, these red kites would dive down right in front of uh, the cars as we were driving, sort of going for the roadkill on on uh, on this kind of busy A road as we were heading out. Um, so it, it really started from there. And then through the course of my professional career, it, it's, it sort of developed into something else, I would say. Um, so I'm a, a journalist in my day job. Um, been a journalist for about 15 years now. Um, I started off as a, a bottom of the heap as a trainee reporter on a newspaper called the Halifax Evening Courier uh, and worked my way up to another paper called the Yorkshire Post and eventually the Daily Telegraph where I've been for the past nine years now um, and uh, I'm a general feature writer but uh, sort of specialise in environmental journalism and it's having the sort of privilege to uh, go out in the field, meet people like David and uh, sort of really tap into, it's the great, for me, the greatest sort of privilege of being a journalist is you get to meet experts in their field every day and talk to them and ask them questions about whatever you want to ask to. So, so that kind of doing that around sort of nature and the natural world sort of soaked up that enthusiasm and, uh, and yeah, so, so, so that's it really. Uh, of course, that's how we met in the first place, wasn't it? Because we, uh, I think you were writing a piece about something and you called me in 
as a, as an expert to be interviewed and it was obviously uh, pre covid days so we actually met i think we met in hampstead heath maybe or we yeah we did be there i'm not sure if that's the first time we met oh. i remember we did go there and it was a sort of mutual friend of ours had developed an app that's um right the Detect Bird song, and we were writing a piece about that. Um, I'm sure we'd met before. I, I really mm. first remember talking to you, David, when you were behind the uh, the, the the national poll to choose um, Britain's sort of number one bird. And uh, I, it was the robin, wasn't it, that came out on top? Unfortunately, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember talking to you about that and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you sound similarly glum at this beast that you'd unleashed across the nation. Yeah, that's funny, actually. But yeah, you know, so we, we go back a while. That was back in 2015, actually, believe it or not. So that's six years wow. ago. Yeah. So listen, um, as you know, um, and as you all know, Zoomers, this is not um, a book review uh, in conservation, where it's more of a chat about stuff. I mean, but when I heard that Joe had written this book, um, I, I was really fascinated because the weather is something that I think fascinates all of us. Um, why do you think it's so derided in the UK, for example, when people say, oh, you know, let's talk about the weather as if it's some sort of, you know, the last thing you can possibly talk about? Why do, why do people, why are people like that? Well, it's, it's the cliche, isn't it? It is our national cliche that what we do is delight in talking about the weather but I think like all cliches it's true and uh, the, so almost ever since I've been at the Telegraph I've written a weekly weather column for the paper and it appears uh, in the Saturday edition of the Telegraph and uh, it's only a small thing it's only a couple of hundred words you know and uh, it, it existed long before before me and it will exist long after I'm gone as well but it's a bit of an institution this column and uh, when I was given it, my editor's sort of slightly cryptic instruction to me at the time was to write about anything but the weather. And uh, that was very daunting for a sort of young journalist. They were, what am I going to say? And it very sort of quickly, you know, started to find my feet with it and found that really what people just wanted to, to, to how they wanted it to be was just to begin that conversation and talk about those sort of different things that we all sort of notice about the weather each week. Um, and whatever you do, my editor gave me this advice and I didn't follow it on the first column. She said, whatever you do, don't try and forecast anything. And uh, I looked at the, 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 the Met Office sort of five day um, forecast for Britain before I filed my first column. And it was um, sunshine or it was a very rare weekend, sunshine all over the British Isles. Apart from there was a tiny little blot of rain above uh, Shetland um, in the very far north of the country. And I thought, fine, I'll, I'll mention this in the column that um, everywhere was, you know, beautifully sunny apart from, from Shetland. And I think it was, I, I was writing about a Philip Larkin poem as well in the same column. And I sort of mentioned Shetland as an afterthought. And uh, on Monday, I received a letter of complaint. And no, sorry, it was on Tuesday, I got the letter of complaint. And it was sent from a Telegraph reader living on the Shetland Isles on the Isle of uh, Unst, it was. And uh, he'd said, contrary to my, I still remember, I've still got it. I've got, uh, and I'll talk about this in a minute. I've got all these letters uh, that I've been sent, but it says, Con contrary to your erroneous reporting, Shetland was basking in glorious sunshine. And he, he said he'd only got round to reading my column on the Monday because it takes, uh, because of the, the, the shipping to Shetland, it took uh, the, the, the boat carrying the papers out 24 hours to get there. And he only got around to reading it um, after that. But uh, he was very nice. He invited me up there to come and see the, 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 the beautiful islands for myself sometime. And uh, that, that first letter really, um, going back to your question about the, 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 the sorts of conversations we have about the weather, David, that first letter, has been the first of hundreds of letters I've received from readers of the column. And it's in a way very frustrating because I get far more letters about that than anything else I write. And you know, I'll have a big magazine piece, I'll pour my heart into sort of spend a month writing it and no one will say anything. But this little thing on a Saturday, get hundreds and hundreds and I've kept them all over the years. I've got a big folder filled with them. 
And they're all people giving their own weather observations about just what the weather is doing, exactly kind of where they are. So, you know, what, what's happening in their garden that maybe they've tended for 40, 50 years. Um, what's happening in their local woods, um, asking questions, you know, um, and, and kind of telling me bits of folklore and stuff. And what really gave me the idea for the book was people writing about the changes they were starting to see. So um, flowers emerging at different times, much earlier than uh, they would have done a decade or so previously, uh, or seeing new birds in their garden that they wouldn't have seen over winter um, a few years previously, or in, in the case of, of summer migrants, suddenly not seeing birds at all when previously they would. And it sort of became clear there was this pattern of, 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 of sort of the everyday impact of climate change on people's lives and not the sort of climate change that you see in the news that we see, you know, in North America at the moment, but the kind of everyday way that climate change was, was, was sort of altering our lives and altering the passage of the four seasons in Britain as we know and understand them and as a sort of embedded in our culture. Um, so that was why I decided to, to write the book. Interesting. And um, we'll talk about the situation in the Western US a bit later. I know we got um, Jo Seal, one of our regulars, um, Zuma, she's from San Diego, so I'm sure she'll have a lot to say about what's happening at the moment. Um, I guess you're you're kind of better known then by a lot of people that follow you as a, as a guy that's like a weather guy. Whereas I know you, I kind of know you as a, a kind of a natural history writer, but in reality you are kind of all of them <laughs> plus more. <laughs> so yeah, my this is my second book. My first book, uh, A Shadow Above, um, was all about ravens and people, and. Uh, looked into it came out in 2018 I think it was and it was my first book and uh, it was about how sort of uh, the folklore around ravens and how ravens are interwoven in human history uh, as I mentioned earlier I, I studied history at university and I've it's particularly the kind of history bit of natural history that I find especially fascinating um, and uh, yeah I guess I guess to, to, to many people, I'm the weather guy, David. <laughs> I mean, with this book, I mean, you know, looking through it, there is such a lot of detail. And what's more, you know, when people talk about I went on a journey, you seriously went on a journey. I can't, I don't think there's any way you haven't been in this book. Um, you've been everywhere, um, you know, talking to people about the weather and about history and about nature. So it's really quite a fascinating thing. How would you actually describe this book in a nutshell for those watching this now? Um, I mean, it, at its most sort of base level, I guess it's a, it's a journalistic work. Um, much like my, my last book was, you know, I, f I feel like you need to play to your strengths and my strength as a journalist, I don't have, you know, the, 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 the naturalist knowledge of someone like David, um, but what, what I am good at and what I can do is go out and find stories and talk to people and, and report about, you know, what people were going through and feed that into a sort of wider narrative. Um, and, and with something as personal as the weather, because um, that's why I wanted to make this book. I wanted it to be personal. You know, there's any number of books that will give you all the facts and figures about climate change and um, what's happening in terms of, you know, emissions feeding into global temperature rises and the sort of catastrophe that lies ahead. There's, there's any number of books that do that, but I really try and stay away from, uh, from that in this and make it about sort of people and everyday experience. I feel like as a sort of, as a reader, I'm always more interested if it's not presented to me as something that's sort of abstract, but it's, it's someone's real life that they're telling you about and it frames Personally, it frames that all differently. Um, so I'd say it's a sort of personal story. Um, and uh, it's, um, yeah, and it's a kind of, it's, it's a, I wanted to basically to, 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 to talk about climate change in a different way. And to, it's something I've got quite used to doing in, in the column because climate change is obviously a very loaded term. And uh, it, particularly in these sort of divided, politicized times that we live in, you know, you can immediately start an argument uh, and uh, with it. And, and I kind of wanted to 
present it to people in a different way. So to focus on things like um, the seasons and sort of much loved species and, and so on, and sort of tell the story through, uh, through humans and also through the natural world it, it itself um, to sort of, yeah, outline it in a different way, I suppose. Yeah, well, let's talk about climate change now we're actually talking about it. You know, let's, let's just uh, explore it a bit more. Um, I suppose when people started speaking about it in a big way, you know, maybe 10 years ago, whatever, there was, from my mind, or to my mind, two sort of schools of thought. There was the guys who thought, or the people that thought that it's a natural sort of cycle of life, um, nothing to do with us. And then the other side of the coin, which is it's totally everything to do with us. Um, so what would you say, um, without being political, but what would you say to someone who turns around and says, yeah, but who gives a, I mean, one or three degrees over 20 or 30 years, what difference does that make? What difference would that make? Well, we're already um, seeing uh, across the world uh, the, 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 the impact that these incremental uh, temperature rises are having. Um, and what we're just going to see is that sort of magnified hugely. There's a part of the book where um, uh, I'm uh, right about um, the Sahel in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, I was there on a, a magazine story for The Telegraph um, a few years ago, uh, writing about a, an initiative called the Great Green Wall, which is attempting to plant trees all the way across that belt to sort of st stop the desertification and to uh, help people who, you know, help sort of restore livelihoods and, and fertile farmland in um, a part of the world where it's just sort of disappearing. Um, I was in Chad and uh, around the shores of Lake Chad, which is was once uh, one of Africa's largest lakes and has shrunk by over 90 percent in about 50 years. Um, and reporting on the ground from there, you see the impact of that, you know, there are whole villages where they relied on fishing and their fathers and grandfathers relied on fishing. And there's no lake to fish in anymore. Um, and uh, it, it feeds there into much wider sort of unrest and, and uh, conflict. Boko Haram, when we were there, were um, uh, constantly sort of waging war um, with the uh, with the, the the Chad government. And it's now, um, I was hearing on the radio today, it's increasingly ISIS. Um, and they're sort of recruiting people as, you know, whose, whose livelihoods have gone and don't have any other kind of option um, when someone comes into the village and starts offering money around and so on. Um, and uh, we're seeing in the West, you know, that's the real sharp end of the climate crisis. But then we're seeing in the West ever increasing numbers of refugees, climate refugees coming from um, places like that. I went to Senegal on that same trip as well. And there were whole villages where they called them villages without men because all the men had uh, left to go to Europe because there was lit there was no employment um, locally. So you, you do what you need to do to support your families. And um, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's something that is going to affect every single country, whether uh, obviously in the West we're sort of protected enough by the wealth of our countries that we're not as reliant on the seasons as we once were and it's still happening in, in parts of those countries where you know the seasons are quite literally a matter of life and death and if it doesn't rain you don't get food to feed your family but there's indirect consequences of of what's happening as well um so yeah i mean the the, the sorts of consequences are huge of what lies ahead yeah it's interesting to talk about western europe i'm in spain at the moment in extremadura um in southwest spain which borders portugal and the summers I mean, I've experienced maybe six summers now, and even over six summers, I can tell that it's definitely heating up. Um, the locals are saying, you know, even people that lived there all their lives are saying, this is too hot. There was a day, or should I say a week or two, maybe two weeks ago when it was, two years ago, even should I say, when it was plus 40 every day for two weeks. Um, and I know that that's what's happening in Western US at the moment. Um, I've been hearing that the, I think the record, the overall record has been broken now, 46 point, whatever it was, which is incredibly high. Two things really. Do you think um, that people are now just bandying around this term climate change 
to basically cover or to talk about any change of weather and they attribute it to climate change. And the other thing I wanted to ask was, in your own opinion, do you think that the inertia of what we've been doing to the planet, you know, burning fossil fuels, you know, all the stuff we're doing, removing forests and all that sort of stuff, do you think that it's too late to put a break on it now, even though we're having these summits to talk about, you know, let's say, you know, let's stop this and try and be more green, yeah. what have you. Do you think it's too late? On the, on the first point, um, what I try and um, write about a lot in the book, actually, is, is we need to be careful in terms of idealising the weather that went before. And um, all of us, our minds play tricks on us with the weather. Um, when you look back to your own childhoods, we all remember the the sort of most sort of, um, you know, when you think of summer, you think of those endless long summer days playing in the park, uh, perfect sort of crisp snowy winters, you know, everyone remembers the snow days at school. Um, a really sort of clear memory pronounced in my head as a kid walking to primary school in autumn through sort of piles of London plain leaves, kind of scuffing new trainers through them and so on. And we remember these sort of, you know, perfect days that represents each season um, because they are perfect and, you know, they stick in our minds, but we forget all the sorts of dreary washout days in between and all the times when it wasn't snowing and the winter wasn't doing what it should do and all the rest. And we have this kind of, we have this idealized view of the four seasons in our minds. And when the weather doesn't match up to that, it's very easy to reach for, for climate change. And, um, and actually when, so uh, in Britain, we have um, this amazing network of uh, weather stations that have been in existence for hundreds of years in some instances, monitoring temperatures, rainfall, so on every single day. Uh, and one of the oldest is in my home city in Sheffield um, in, a, in a place called Western Park. Um, and for the, for the book, I spent a, a quite a lot of time uh, with the curators of the weather station um, and talking through some of their data and what they've seen uh, over the past. It was opened in 1882 and has been continuously recording ever since then. So it gives a really good, you know, long-term data set of, of, of what the weather is doing in that particular area. It's got a, a very interesting history briefly as well, that weather station. It was set up by the Sheffield Corporation because they were beginning to see all these outbreaks of strange diseases in what was at the time a rapidly industrializing city, you know, the birthplace of, 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 of steel and so on. And they thought the weather might have something to do with it. So they set up this weather station to, to try and monitor that and see and uh, put a local guy in charge who was called Elijah Howarth. And uh, he immediately became a local celebrity. He was called Elijah the Prophet. And um, he'd go out uh, measuring uh, in all weathers four times a day, uh, measuring uh, the instruments that were there, gleaming like brand new instruments at that time no one had ever seen before, and writing them down in these huge leather bound ledgers. And uh, the, the museum where, that's connected to the weather station, it still has all these original ledgers now, and it still has um, people sort of adding to them. Um, in 2019, it was its 50,000th day of recording. Um, and what, what that data shows is that our weather is variable. You know, there are decades where the weather is drier, there are decades where it's, it's, it's rainier. And if you imagine it like this, you know, it's, it's, it's shifting the whole time. But also what that data shows is that the extreme weather events are without any shadow of a doubt increasing. Um, we're not necessarily seeing more rainfall overall, but far higher um, moments of extreme rainfall. Um, and similarly, the temperatures are rising. You know, um, in 2019, for example, the weather station recorded one of its first winters where not a single flake of uh, settled snow uh, was recorded um, that whole uh, winter. That same year was also the wettest November in Sheffield's history, and overall it was the wettest year in Sheffield's history. And on that 50,000th day of recording that I mentioned in July, the very next day, the 50,000th and first day of recording, 
uh, notched up Sheffield's hottest day ever in its history as well. And all that's just within a year. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's um, to answer your first question, David, the weather has always changed, um, but now it's changing beyond something um, that, uh, uh, that, that science has seen before, really. Yeah, to before answer your you, second... Before you do ask the second question, just to, to, to finish off on the first one, even though we can never finish off on it, you're right, you know, as kids, you know, I remember when I was a kid, the endless summer holidays, blue skies, wearing your shorts, you know, outside and in a park, you're right. And then you hear people saying, yeah, well, you know, that was then and now the weather's different. And you kind of, as you say, you, you grow up and you think, yeah, the weather is different. But it's, is it? I mean, I, I sometimes think, is it anecdotal? Is it, it you said yeah. earlier, it, we, we kind of trick ourselves into thinking it was idyllic and we forget about the... Yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting. I, I love this idea that we're, we're unreliable narrators of our own stories when it comes to the weather because of that. And our minds do play tricks on us. There was a fascinating study that was done by academics at King's College London a couple of years ago. Um, which I write about in the book, and they uh, look to the extent to which we um, that we sort of deceive ourselves about the weather and tell ourselves a better story about the weather, in effect. So what they did, they got all the participants together and gave them all diaries, and at first um, played them sort of sound effects of particularly dramatic weather, the sort of weather that's looming behind David's head right now. So sort of peals of thunder and lightning and rain and all the rest of it. And just asked people to write down what they were feeling. And they then gave them these diaries to take away for, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks or a month and just said, um, don't write about anything else but your own feelings in this time. So, you know, if you're waking up and you're feeling sad, write about that, feeling frustrated, so on. These people all did that and then gave the diaries back to the researchers. They then compared them to the meteorological data over the course of that time. And their findings were um, across the board. They said, you know, they called it uh, weather-induced um, nostalgia, I think, and basically how adverse weather provokes feelings of nostalgia. So when we're seeing weather that uh, is, is sort of dramatic or, you know, unfamiliar in some ways, we retreat back into this idealized um, version. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's sort of, that is fascinating and I love that. Um, and uh, to answer your second question, David, and it's a really important one actually, because it's something that I try very hard in, in the book and I've tried very hard over a decade of writing this weather column is to keep up and I try and you know every piece I write about uh, nature and the natural world is to, to, to maintain an air of hope about everything because I think if there's hopelessness and if you just think you know the, the words gone to hell and anchor and what's the point then you lose interest and you just sort of you know you kind of disengage and I think there are real stories of, of, of hope about um, what we have what we can do to um, uh, sort of mitigate against some of the worst impacts of climate change and as a result uh, benefit nature as well there's a there's an example I give in the book which um, was in a place called Saddleworth Moor in the Peak District not far from me and uh, in 2018 Saddleworth Moor had the worst wildfire in living memory. Um, 1,000 hectares of the moor um, were burnt. Um, and uh, I was uh, sent there as a, as a journalist on the day of the fire. I remember getting there early on when the um, fire brigades were there and they were, it was pre-COVID in 2018, obviously, but they gave us all surgical masks to wear. I remember wearing that for the day, conducting interviews and thinking how bizarre it was. And how, you know, looking back at that few years, how it's the most normal thing in the world now. Um, but uh, I went back to the scene of the fire a year after um, to, as part of the research for the book, to talk to some of the conservationists who were working up on the moor. And uh, I was taken up to a part of the moor where they're re-wetting it and restoring it to this peatland habitat, to its natural state. And they showed me where the fire had ended and it was, a perfect line, even a year on, you could see the line perfectly marked out in the heather. And it was where the conservationists had been um, planting plugs of sphagnum moss, which is originally would have um, comprised that habitat. And they're these incredibly clever plant that can sort of soak up eight times their own volume in, in water and create basically what is a giant sponge. Um, 
And uh, where the fire had reached this moss, it had just stopped dead. And on the other side of the moor that hadn't been caught up in the wildfire and that had, is being rewetted, um, they're seeing all sorts of benefits in terms of nature. You know, they're seeing uh, crane flies and, and, and insects that were uh, sort of dwindling elsewhere in the moors coming back. And they're seeing um, really sort of threatened birds like dunlin, golden plover, um, all sort of um, increasing breeding pairs of them and quite dramatically so compared to, to elsewhere in there. And at the same time, by re-wetting it, you are creating or sort of, because uh, in their original state, these peatland habitats, as, as many of you will know, are incredible carbon sinks. They're some of the best things we've got in Britain for, uh, for sort of retaining carbon dioxide. But in if they get to a degraded uh, enough state, they begin to be emitters of carbon instead. But by restoring them to that, you're not only sort of creating a, a literal fire break, but you're also benefiting nature and having these sorts of carbon sinks as well. So I feel that's, you know, one of these examples where you see all these things working together. And there's so many examples like that, that, that we can do. So it's, it's, I want it to be a hopeful book um, all the way yeah. through. No, that's important. I mean, it's on my side of the fence talking about, you know, birds, you, know, you want to make it a positive message to get people engaged and not feeling there's no point. Um, fire is something that, you know, is happening more and more. I mean, look at America now and, in Australia, that dreadful fire that happened um, last year, and then the fires even in the UK. And in the book, you talk about Portugal and the scourge, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to trees, is the eucalyptus that's been introduced, as it has done, in, has been, shall I say, in other parts of Spain, including Extremadura. Can you tell that's us a little bit about that? Oh, we've yeah. got a major problem here in Extremadura with, with uh, right. yeah. the eucalyptus. Can you tell us what the issue is with uh, the eucalyptus and fire? Yeah, so this was this was actually the same summer as that Saddleworth Moor fire I was talking about in 2018, which was the, what we were seeing in Britain was being replicated all over uh, the Western world. You know, there were 11 wildfires off the top of my head that were raging in the Arctic that summer. And uh, Portugal um, is, a, is a country that I'm sure many of you know has been particularly badly affected by wildfires. Um, I went up to a place in the north of Portugal um, where they'd uh, seen wildfires sort of sweeping over the hills there and uh, interview. I went with a, a Portuguese journalist friend um, and uh, we spent about a week there in some of the villages that have been worst affected talking to, to people that live there and so on and uh, I hadn't known actually David anything about the eucalyptus issue before I went out there and was amazed by, by, by what I discovered really, where it was um, the way that the, the countryside is there, it's very sort of fragmented patchwork of, of privately owned bits of land that have belonged to individual families for decades, centuries, and they get passed down through the generations. And increasingly, as uh, society urbanizes, you've got young people moving down into the cities and basically leaving this land alone or selling up and increasingly sort of older uh, uh, people living on them who haven't got the sort of money or the energy to maintain their um, land as they once would. And then you've got these sort of, um, uh, the, 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 the paper industry is huge in Portugal. It's one of its biggest um, industries, in fact. So you've got a lot of these sort of middlemen who uh, go on to go to people who have got these bits of land and offer the money to plant eucalyptus trees. And it's a sort of offer that's too good to refuse for many people because it's a very fast growing crop. They'll grow the trees on their land for a number of years. Someone will come along and cut them down, take them to the mills and, and, and that's that really. Um, and it's led to a huge transformation of the landscape where all these, um, what were sort of old mixed broadleaf forests have just been replaced by bank after bank of eucalyptus trees and it's so striking um, when you get there and eucalyptus trees also their um, original name um, I think they originate from Australia off the top of my yeah. head yeah. and their, their original name in the indigenous languages they're a tree of fire um, because not only do they suck uh, water out of the ground but they also have an incredibly high oil content as well so what you've created is, is a sort of, and it was really interesting actually being there and seeing the similarities with Saddleworth Moor, two totally different landscapes, but a similar problem in that um, it had been sort of altered 
in recent decades by humans in Saddleworth, you know, they drain the moorlands and establish sort of monocultures of heather for grouse shooting. In, uh, in, in Portugal, they planted these sort of massive forests of eucalyptus, but it led to the same um, outcome where it stripped away the land's ability to cope with what are increasing wildfires as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it had been a, uh, it'd been a huge um, problem there. Again though, and I'm sorry to bang on about stories of hope, but I did find some there where there was um, villages that are um, taking the sort of matters into their own hands and planting natural fire breaks around them. So restoring um, uh, woodland around villages of um, uh, traditional Portuguese species that are very good and fire resistant, things like um, cork oak, for example, or fruit trees. And uh, they, they would have been um, spared the worst of the, uh, the fires, the, the villages that had done this. So again, you know, people are starting to get on top of this now, but it's a big, big problem. Yeah, I mean, world over. I mean, I've seen stands, loads of, you know, like forests even of, of eucalyptus, even places like Brazil. And it's just incredible where these people have uh, planted these trees. Mm. Um, slight, slight change of subject, even though we are still talking about the weather. Have you ever been frightened by the weather? I mean, I was explaining to you earlier before we started recording that this scene behind me was the start of a storm and I was by this reservoir in Extremadura in southwestern Spain and I was watching a Montague's Harrier flying around and it landed and sat in the grass 25, 30 feet away from me and then suddenly the, the heavens opened and there was this bird just sitting there, you know, and I was thinking, come in the car with me, you know, <laughs> it's, it's dry in here. Um, so I, I weathered the storm, so to speak, and then suddenly there was this hailstorm and it was like hell. I mean, there's like lumps of ice and I've never seen that in Extremadura before in the summer. And it was making such a racket. I was thinking, what about that poor bird? And I felt a bit scared thinking, I'm the highest point here. If, the, if there's a if there's an electrical sort of, you know, charge somewhere, I'm, 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 I'm a done for. And then, as you said earlier, I started getting all sort of you know, romantic and thinking about the past and oh, well, I had a good life, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then this, the storm moved away and then as if nothing happened, the Montague's Harrier up again flying around. And I told you also, but when I was a kid, I was afraid of electrical storms until I forced myself to watch one because I thought by watching electrical storms, you could go blind. So uh, have you ever been frightened? It's a really good question actually, David. I'm thought about this for a long time but as you were talking the, the memory came back to me and when I was a kid we went camping on the Isle of Wight once and uh, my older brother who's two years old than me had gone down to um, uh, gone down to the the beach from from the campsite that was up on the cliffs above and uh, we'd just gone down in our towels and and, and, and swimming shorts and, and that was it and uh, as we got onto the beach the sort of heavens opened and a huge summer storm a bit like what you're describing but thankfully no hail picked up and uh, washed we'd walked down this um there was clay paths if i remember and uh, we'd walked down them and the rain was so fierce that it washed the path away so we couldn't get back up again we were too small to make it back up to um the the campsite and i remember uh, me and my brother huddling um, together under these cliffs, incredibly dangerous thinking <laughs> about now, the worst place to hide, but we were about 10 and 12, so you'll forgive us. And uh, him wrapping a, a towel around me and um, just waiting. Luckily, our dad came down and, and found us and, and rescued us. But I remember them being, yeah, terrified. And um, that sort of awesome, it's when you see the awesome power of the weather, isn't it? Uh, is 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 when it um, when it grips you and there aren't um, thankfully such are the costed lives that many of us lead now there aren't that many moments in, in life where you really are exposed to it like that um, but yeah that memory is very clear terrifying I remember being exposed to a massive storm when I was walking through Hyde Park Kensington Gardens in central London you may think nothing of it but the thing was it was back in the days when people had um, permed hair I had permed hair and the rain was so wet that all the crap that I put in my, all the chemicals in my hair went into my eyes. My eyes were just totally red. I couldn't see anything. That was a bad fashion day, I tell you. Um, your book. One, uh, just on your Montague's Harrier, by the way, David, because one other really early memory I have of the weather was um, 
the great storm of, uh, it was 1989, wasn't it? 87. 87. Yeah. So I was only um, three years old at the time. Um, but I remember walking um, around my local park, which was called Highbury Fields afterwards. And there were these um, huge trees that had been taken down in the storm. Millions of trees were uprooted during that storm, weren't they? Yeah. And uh, they were left lying in the park. And eventually a local sculptor came along and was commissioned to make these sculptures out of these trees. And I remember that as a, as a kid as well. And actually for the anniversary, for the 30th anniversary of that um, storm, and uh, I went back to uh, a woodland in Kent. It was in the south of the country uh, that was particularly badly hit. And these woodlands, um, ancient woodlands, um, really sort of uh, devastated um, by the storm. And uh, I went back to one for a bit of the research for, for the book. And uh, it was amazing seeing how the resilience of, of nature in the face of that weather, a bit like your Montague's Harry, you know, we fear for Things. And at the time, the, the trees that were taken down were seen as just a sort of absolute disaster. But it was amazing seeing what had happened in that 30 year period. So these huge old uh, chestnut trees, they were sweet chestnut trees, I think, in the wood where we were, had, were lying. You could still see them lying on uh, the forest where they'd uh, gone down. But the um, what had been the branches had now turned into the trunk of the new tree growing up. And you saw these new trees growing out of these uh, these sort of fallen giants um, in amazing contorted shapes and sort of feeding on the nutrients as they were decaying. The woodland had also become uh, a, a reserve for um, a sort of amazing array of beetles as well, um, sort of feasting on all the uh, decaying wood there as well. So it really showed the sort of resilience. And I talk about this in the book, the resilience of nature to cope with this, what can feel like us humans as apocalyptic weather. Yeah, I mean, these, I mean, these, these organisms even have been, you know, suffering these things for, for eons, haven't they? They've, they've gone through all that, so they've uh, adapted to it. It's interesting, that storm in 87, I, I, I was slightly older than you. I was actually on the, the Isles of Scilly at the time. Oh, wow. We, just, we escaped it, you know, it was fine. And I was really gutted because, I mean, obviously, not because of the damage, but because there were some really good birds blown into London. Mm. I didn't see him because I was on, on the Isles of Scilly. So there you go. Um, in your book, you talk about, you know, the seasons, you talk about history and folklore, which is really fascinating. Um, my question is, in other cultures where there could be up to 72 different seasons in, seasons in the year, why are there only four seasons in the UK and in most of, most of the world, really? Or why are only four seasons actually sort of globally recognised now? What, um, what I was really, I only discovered in the process of writing the book was how relatively new the four seasons are in our cultural memory. Um, and uh, in sort of, I went back through, you know, kind of old, our oldest English text and uh, spoke to sort of experts in the field. And, and for the Anglo-Saxons, um, they only had two seasons, which is um, the same as the Vikings as well. Uh, there was light, six months of light and six months of darkness. And when you read um, texts like Beowulf and, and the Wanderer and so on, they're really framed in this opposition between the two. Um, the idea of the four seasons um, came about much later, actually. It was, um, uh, a lot of it was due to, um, uh, in medieval period and a lot of it due to the influence of uh they were troubadour poets and uh they came particularly over from france and would tour the country kind of telling stories of uh you know folklore and and and, and so on and it was through that that we began to talk about autumn um and spring um they didn't exist in the same way um before and uh we just had um uh, summer and vetter were uh, more original ways of talking about the seasons um so it's really you know it's people like chaucer um and shakespeare they were the ones who sort of implanted this memory of the four seasons i think chaucer is the first written example of autumn um the word autumn being used in uh, in the english language written down at least and you know chaucer was writing in I'm going to get this wrong now, but 14th century, I think, off the top of my head. Apologies if I'm wrong. <laughs> I have no idea. And uh, so it's a very recent thing, and it's a it's a cultural thing as well. 
Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating because I've been watching the Vikings on Netflix and now I look at it differently because they do talk about seasons. So they got it wrong there. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but what I do know or have noticed uh, in the UK for me is that you have a, a summer and then it sort of melds into October and then November. But then it's November, 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 November. And then it sort of becomes April. There seems to be very little variation these days. Mm. Um, again, is that something that's anecdotal? Did you find that in the book or was that due to climatic changes, do you think? Well, in my um, previous life, I was a crime correspondent um, for the Yorkshire Post and um, would spend my days um, thinking and enjoying nature, but going and writing about murders and uh, other nefarious crimes that were taking place. And I thought for this book, I'd sort of go back to a bit of that and use a bit of, of those reporting skills and rely on a science um, called phonology. Um, and what's, what phonology does, I'm sure many of you will know it, it it's follows the passage of the seasons through signs in nature. Um, so, you know, when uh, certain flowers appear and when uh, first a particular species of birds are sighted for the first time, um, the first insects of the season, the last insects of the season, you know, when the leaves fall off the trees. Um, we've got an amazing, um, it, it, was, it was coined in the 18th century, I think, by a Belgian man, but really sort of took off in, in Britain um, in that same uh in that same century as well, when weather diaries became a very sort of popular thing um, that naturalists um, started to keep. Gilbert White is a, a classic example, you know, he'd all, always be writing about the weather and uh, there's, the British Library is filled with these um, weather diaries. Um, and uh, this sort of spawned into a national recorder network. Um, it was run by the uh, Royal Meteorological Society for a bit and nowadays uh, in the post-war period has been run by the Woodland Trust. Um, their project is called Nature's Calendar. And through these, um, these sightings, this massive sort of citizen science network, you can study the passage of the seasons, you can follow the seasons. So they know, for example, uh, that spring uh, begins in the southwest of the country and travels up in a northeasterly direction they know that it used to move at about 1.2 miles an hour, but in recent decades, it's accelerated um, uh, to two miles an hour. Um, and they can say that um, spring can be considered sprung uh, nine days earlier now than it could a few decades ago. And uh, they can also, um, what these sorts of um, phenological uh, sightings and evidence shows us is what's happening in terms of the seasons bleeding into one another, a bit like you talk about, David. Um, so uh, there's another study, um, which is uh, led by the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, and it's been going for 10 years now, and it's called the New Year Plant Hunt. And it's uh, a study that was set up to show uh, the extent to which um, the changing climate is influencing um, plants in winter. Um, and I, uh, they, they send volunteers out across the country uh, in the first four days of January to go out and just record what flowers they can see in bloom. Uh, I went out with them for the book and spent a very sort of interesting uh, morning in a, a nature reserve in North Yorkshire, looking around to what flowers we could see. That year we saw um, 690 species in bloom, which was a record at the time. Uh, that record, is just, it gets broken year on year and year on year. And it, uh, this uh, most recent one, despite it being a relatively cold winter, they still found 710 species in bloom. Um, in the botanical world, they called this uh, autumn stragglers. So they would, uh, flowers that would um, appear in uh, autumn. And while they would normally, in, in previous decades, they'd go into a dormant phase, they were now just sort of persisting all the way through, uh, all the way through the winter. And uh, you see it with, with, with many birds as well, David, you know, things like blackcaps, for example, increasingly overwintering uh, in the UK. A lot of that's down to people feeding them in their gardens, but also more favourable climatic conditions. Um, things like long-tailed tits, wren, goldcrest, all doing much, much better than they would have done. They don't simply die off in, in periods anymore. Um, so you can, 
if you sort of follow nature, it tells us what's happening to seasons. And that's what I tried to do for the book. And really the, the sort of outcome of that was the idea that I write in the book, you know, in my childhood memory of the seasons as being quartered like an apple are just a sort of mush these days, really. Okay. Why, why does the weather affect us so much? Why does it affect our mood so much? I mean, I'm, I'm in Spain and I talk to people and they say, oh, I couldn't be living in England. I love being in London, but the grey skies will get me down. Can't do it. So why does it affect us? It's um, the, the, the impact of uh, the weather on human health is something that has preoccupied us for as, as long as people have been writing stuff down um there's some amazing old uh weather diaries written by um doctors in the 17th century that i read quite a few of in, in research in the book in the british library and uh they talk about um prescribing certain treatments at certain times of year depending on the weather so for example when we got to autumn it was common practice a bit like a flu jab now where they'd recommend that you got uh, at least uh, about a pint of, of blood drained to prepare you for what lay ahead. <laughs> and uh, similarly, um, there, uh, vapors were seen to be a huge um, uh, problem. So, you know, sort of, if it wasn't a frosty enough winter, then the, the vapors rising off the marshes were seen to have a real effect on human health as well. And, and equally, it was seen to, to define character. So, I mean, considering the the area in which they're written it was obviously a, a very sort of jingoistic time for, for Britain anyway but a lot of these doctors talk about how because of its um uh, its its geographical position and fanned by sort of temperate uh sea winds from from every direction that led to a more sort of measured British state of mind and character as well I don't I'm, it's not something I agree with but it, it was interesting to read nonetheless as a, a sort of historical perspective um, and then in, 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 in very recent and ongoing um, studies, you know, we're seeing the impact of um, things like seasonal affective disorder. And, um, you know, all the science tells us that the further north you go uh, the, and, and the less exposure to daylight you have, the far higher um, uh, prevalence of, of, of things like SAD that, that you have as well. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I mean, we're living organisms like everything else and it affects us in, in all kinds of ways. In your book you've uh, you met a load of characters um, you know talked about them and talked with them one of them caught my eye tell us about Muff Upsall what kind of name is that is that a real name for the star? <laughs> Muff <laughs> Upsall and who is she and what's she about? Well, she's a, a sort of lesser character in the book, really, I guess. She was, um, and I've, I've mentioned already the, the, the New Year plant hunt. Um, so she was um, one of the volunteers uh, in that. And it was at her house where I met the, um, where I met the plant hunters in the morning. Um, I was actually terrified getting there because um, I'd just been told by the, the contact at the BSBI to meet at a farmhouse in this village in Staveley that was near to a horse paddock. And back when I was a journalist at the Yorkshire Post, I'd actually written a, one of my first stories. Um, I'd written about um, a, a house next to a horse paddock in Staveley that was owned by the council head of highways. And uh, he'd got in all kinds of trouble because the, uh, the, the sort of roads were covered in potholes all over North Yorkshire but he had um, a newly paved, uh, beautifully paved country lane that ran between the farmhouse and the uh, horse paddock. And all the villagers were up in arms saying, you know, there'd been all this corruption and stuff. So as I was driving up there, I was really hoping that it wasn't this guy's house. And if it was, that he didn't remember. Uh, but fortunately, a lovely woman called Muff Upsall, uh, which is a very bizarre name, I agree, um, opened the door and, uh, because it was just after Christmas, uh, gave me a lovely plate of mince pies. So I won't say a, a, a bad word against her. Yeah, anyone that gives me a plate of mince pies is my best mate forever, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, all right, Joe, we've had a really nice chat about the weather. Uh, one, well, two important questions I need to ask you now. Uh, firstly, um, can you name your favorite bird? Hmm. 
I should say the Raven, um, having written a book about them, but I think I'm going to go for Kestrels. Um, I just love everything about them. I love the way they um, do so well in, in, you know, bits of landscape that you think, you know, the side of motorways and A roads and the, um, places where, you know, you think, how does, how does anything um, thrive there? And they, and they do. And I just think the more I've um, found out about them and read about them, you know, the way they can just hover there and just sort of see uh, these, uh, um, the, 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 the sort of prey so far below and the way they dive. Where I live in Sheffield is a very hilly city and up in the Peak District, you can sometimes find yourself above a kestrel looking down at it and it's a, it's a magnificent sight. Um, so I think I'll go for a kestrel. But if you ask me in a few weeks time, I'll give you a different bird, David. I, 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 I never stick to my guns with favourite birds, I'm afraid. Okay, what about where would you rather be if you could be? Uh, notwithstanding the actual pandemic, where would you be right now if you could be anywhere else? Hmm. This is obviously a question I'm sure everyone has been asking themselves a lot. Um, my uh, One of my last holidays before um, the pandemic was to Portugal um, and uh, it was on the sort of about halfway down the coast. Um, my wife and I were just um, driving around there, staying in a few B&Bs and stuff. And firstly, to be by the sea would just be magnificent. I live in probably the most landlocked, beautiful, but landlocked part of uh, Britain and have been starved of, of uh, ocean views. Um, and secondly, the bird life there was just wonderful. Um, I particularly loved the stork's nests that you'd see, huge stork's nests in the, uh, on kind of street uh, lampposts, just on uh, busy main roads. And the way that other smaller birds would sort of steal bits of the nest for themselves was wonderful to see. And uh, the two other bird sightings from there that stick in my head were standing on some sea cliffs and looking down as a sort of basin of um, uh, swifts that were, were flying around there. It was just sort of wonderful watching them sort of acrobatically diving in and out and uh, seeing, um, I'd only ever seen one bee eater in my life before this, but we were driving past what was, you know, a, a sort of simple, um, bit of uh, kind of pasture land, nothing special about it at all. And into the side of this muddy bank were a load of holes and we wondered what they were. And suddenly it's all these bee eaters sort of flying in and out of them. And uh, that was just magnificent as well. So take me there, please, David. So you're talking about midway in Portugal, anywhere there, just drop you off anywhere there. Yeah, anywhere there, I'll, I'll find my way to the bee eaters. <laughs> Okay, well, um, Zoomers, um, I normally at this point say what's happening next, but there isn't anything happening next. So basically, you've got the summer off until October when we start up again. So keep an eye out um, on the newsletters and check out Twitter and stuff. And I will be letting you know. And, and also even check the website, theumbertaworld.com for the next lot of people coming through. Um, one thing to mention, I've been talking about it all of the second um, season, and that is that the Urban Bird of World is going to be a membership club. I'm setting up a membership club, which will be actually launching a soft launch on July the 15th. And I'd love to invite all of you um, as founder members. Um, I will be sending you all some information and hopefully you may come and help me set this club up and you know, one day in the future, it's the, the one-stop one shop for urban birds and urban wildlife in the world. Let's hope, let's hope that happens. But anyway, um, Joe, it has been lovely talking with you for now. It's, you know what, it's been, you know, it's been a long time since actually since I last spoke to you, like having a conversation like this, because normally we, we're talking because you're doing an article and I'm giving you information. So it's nice to actually have a conversation. So it was yeah. a really lovely, lovely conversation. I, I wish you all the best with the book folks thank you um so i wish you all the best really nice book um and thank you for coming thank you for having me it's been a, a real pleasure i really enjoyed it i'm glad you did and uh, for the final time this season zoomers um i just want to say it's lovely to have had you the whole season um i'm looking forward to seeing you again i hope you have a very safe summer even if you may not be able to travel that far but still be safe uh but always Keep looking up.